So uh, Sheikh Haroon uh, very uh, confidently promised it was worth the wait, but that's his promise. <laughs> I didn't answer that at all, so uh, my apologies if, uh, uh, if not. So yeah, I'm going to go through some of the work that's emerged from my thesis, as well as some more uh, research I've been doing since then. Um, and it's based on the question of who needs the mosque, uh, who needs the masjid. And need will be a really key element of my presentation. So, um, we're back to take working. So, I'm just going to look at the past, the present, and uh, glance towards the future. So, in terms of the past, uh, it's first going to have a reflection on my thesis, which I'm very pleased to say is fundamentally part of my past now. It's finished, it's over. <laughs> uh, for all the PhD students in there, you know, I, I can totally sympathize, you know, it's, it's a tough part. But for me, I can celebrate because it's over. Um, but then I want to look at some of the literature. What's been produced already? What do we know about mosques? What don't we know? And what can we do with knowing a bit more about? Um, and reflecting on a period of British Muslim history, which some people call the mosque building era, and how significant this is then going into the contemporary period, where I'm going to basically try and articulate a particular part of my thesis findings, my research findings for my PhD, uh, which is a model, the model of the interspatial mosque. And essentially, it's a way of trying to understand the functioning and function of mosques in the UK today. Um, and we'll be looking at essentially this model in operation both locally and maybe nationally. Um, and then just kind of maybe glancing slightly towards the future. Um, what this model might be able to predict about the way in which mosques will be developing in the coming few decades. Um, and it is a really important period we're in right now. Uh, there was an event just before that we were talking about uh, the politics of religious architecture. Um, and it was noted that there is this kind of significant change. It's a kind of period of change because the majority of the British Muslim population came to the UK post Second World War. Um, and we're in a period now where we're just shifting to a point where the majority of the British Muslim population is British born and also statistically largely under the age of 25. So it's a young population and these guys coming of age, they've now got their degrees, they've got the qualifications, they've entered into the uh, workforce and they're starting to take and uh, assume responsibility and leadership for mosques. So there's going to be a shift, there's going to be a change um, and it's important in that direction. But also in looking towards the future, uh, as I will later, it'll be significant because not only is there this period of change in which a young generation come of age, uh, but hinted at, at the last uh, event we were at, there's also an aging Muslim demographic. Um, so, you know, in the past we've had a very young, very small, older population. Um, that's going to be slowly shifting. We're more and more uh, uh, post-60, post-70 in terms of age of the population will become Muslim and then there'll be a whole new range of needs uh, uh, and kind of uh, provisions that's going to be required of this aging British Muslim population. So let's go on. So the past. Uh, I completed my PhD in 2017 um, and essentially looked at a few different things. It looked at sacred space and sacred time. Uh, this was one of the key contributions of my thesis to religious studies. Uh, sacred space being a very key part of both anthropological studies and religious studies in general. Uh, but I kind of tried to add to it by looking at time as well. Because anyone who's been in a mosque will know that it's not just about what takes place, but where it takes place, but also when. You know, you will maybe be a bit loud and rambunctious before Maghrib, but as soon as Maghrib comes in and the uh, dan takes place and that verbal threshold of sacredness emerges and, and is pronounced, behavior changes and the meaning of that space shifts. Um, and so looking at how time is constructed, um, anyone who's been to a Friday Jum'ah will know that, you know, the moment the Imam ascends the pulpit and says Assalamu Alaikum to begin the khutbah, all the murmuring Quran and the prayer and that little murmur of worship will die down and everyone settles down in this silence. And it's silence pretty much until the final salam in which the Imam will conclude the prayer and there'll be a little wait, a few moments of pause and suddenly the loud uh, noise just rip, comes back, the din returns because what happens is that moment of sacredness has passed. The moment of Jummah has kind of uh, zenith, it, it, it's peaked and then you, you move towards different, um, a different time period. And so this rhythmic nature of sacred time and sacred space. And I use rhythm analysis uh, to kind of explore this. It's uh, the work of uh, a sociologist and philosopher called Henry Lefebvre. There's also this idea of conflict and contest and contestation. Uh, when we look at uh, sacred spaces, they're very often places of conflict for lots of different reasons. And this is across the board. And the same when it comes to the mosque. 
uh, one of the incidents, you know, you'll uh, uh, anyone really who's been in the mosque might observe is someone might point their feet towards uh, the qibla, and someone will, you know, remonstrate them and tell them off. You know, you shouldn't put your feet towards the direction of prayer. Someone else might be talking a bit too loud, talking about business, talking about football, and someone else will say, oh, you know, this is the place of worship. What are you doing? And it's kind of, you know, inter kind of uh, 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 congregational sort of remonstration around. Uh, what is the appropriate behavior is also one of the ways in which con uh, the sacredness of this space is created. Um, and there's Roman the analysis, as I mentioned, there's the idea of the coffee shop mosque, this idea of the mosque being a place of informal congregation, of cooperation, of meeting, the idea of an ecumenical mosque as well, increasingly important as a uh, population comes of age. But I highlighted the spatial mosque because that's what I'm going to be talking about. What I've just mentioned to you is a rough tour through some of my PhD findings, but I'm going to focus on today the idea of the interspatial mosque, which is a model for trying to understand the role and function and functioning of mosques, and also maybe understand the contemporary diversity. Um, and I'm gonna be kind of pairing this up with some more recent research I've been doing. So what I took did and undertook was a uh, ethnography. Um, and there was an absence of ethnographic perspectives when it comes to British mosques. So we have a kind of big picture understanding. There's some surveys, there's some quantitative data, we have the registrar of religious buildings. We have some which look at mosques in a particular space. So they might be located in an urban space, a suburban space, a rural space. There might be considerations of uh, the establishment of different types of mosques. But what's really missing is uh, the uh, kind of in-depth case studies, the in-depth understanding of a single mosque to really plow down a single case study and understand what's taking place within the four walls of that mosque, to really understand what's taking place and how meanings are constructed, contested, and things are operating. And with that one case study, it's able and it's possible to then just zoom back and try and understand things a bit more deeply. Um, so I'm essentially taking my PhD research, which was ethnographic, that single case study, that in-depth understanding, and trying to pair it up with some more uh, uh, wider uh, case studies, uh, some, uh, some more big picture findings, to try and give a picture of what mosques might look like today. And it is just at the moment uh, towards hopefully a book, uh, but I hope as well there's scope in this, and I think there is, of uh, conducting a bigger research project maybe sometime in the future. Um, but it's, it is uh, significant because there's essentially this kind of gap in, in ethnographic studies of British Muslims and mosques. And it's significant because uh, when you look at church ethnographies, it's the kind of thing that uh, someone might do, uh, a master student might do as a kind of practice exercise or a task as part of an assignment or a module. It's really quite common. But there's a real absence of the same when it comes to uh, British Muslim studies and, and mosques in particular, not just in the UK, but we're looking also in Europe and America. Um, and so I hope there's this developing trend that we can talk about of maybe British Muslim congregational studies, which is also in part looking at the mosque as an institution and who makes the mosque, but then also looking at the more general British Muslim studies that exists and thinking, well, hold on, people have gone and established mosques, why? What's the significance of the congregation in relation to things like leadership organizations, in, rela in relation to things like religious leadership, in relation to things like authority and um, uh, contemporary politics, um, and really thinking about <coughs> the centrality of the congregation, or whether or not it might be um, central uh, in relation to those questions. Um, but I do have a slide where I look at just some of the existing kind of written literature out there. Uh, if anyone's interested, I can give you a more kind of in-depth overview. But there is research being produced, um, and there is this increasingly rich and varied picture of uh, uh, our understanding of British mosques. Um, but essentially, historically as well, and uh, this is where I really pick up on and give the background to kind of explaining the spatial mosque model, which I talk about. And it's this I idea of the period of the mosque building era. So again, just, you know, there, there are historic mosques that you might talk about. Uh, Liverpool has one. Cardiff actually has one, 1920s based mosque in the docks area of Cardiff Bay, uh, established by Abdullah Ali Hakimi. There's also the Woking Mosque. And there's a few other stuff around the country, these historic mosques. But by and large, the majority of mosques in the UK were built in the 1960s onwards. Um, and on top of that as well, it was from the uh, post-World, Second World War migration. That's when the majority of British Muslims settled. Uh, and in Britain, it's a uh, largely South Asian uh, migration. We can also look at some kind of uh, migration from places in Africa, places in the Middle East, places further uh, eastern India, but uh, generally it's, it's, it's Pakistani and Bangladeshi in character. Um, and this is kind of significant thing that takes place, which is as soon as the laws start changing, forcing migrants sometimes to bring over families, because there's essentially the kind of fear of, uh, you know, essentially um, losing the ability to actually start a family. 
Um, and so individuals who might have had this myth of return, you know, young single men working, earning their money, thinking we're eventually going to go back to Bangladesh or Pakistan and we'll carry on our lives there. Suddenly the laws start changing, things start tightening up, migration rules start becoming more um, uh, 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 sort of uh, um, anti-migration. Um, and there's a sense of, oh, hold on, it's either now or never. So if I ever get, ever get my wife and family over here now, or I might lose the opportunity. And so there's this kind of beat the band sort of migration. Uh, quite a few people observe this. Um, Richard Gale, who's in the back there, talks about it in some of his research. Uh, uh, Gendy Zoot looks at it. And also in this uh, collected paper, a uh, series of papers that looks at uh, mosques in uh, Europe, a similar kind of relationship between the legal st status of migrants um, leading to a change in uh, either the identity of uh, settlement rules, which means there's families, which then suddenly means there's mosques. There's kind of, it can be observed. Um, still very kind of, um, uh, I'd say maybe suggestive in the literature, uh, but I'd argue that it's significant because I think the real key element when it comes to mosques is the need to provide a place of education and religious nurture for children. I think that can really be identified as a big, big key link. I think prior to that, when you had single men uh, who might have been living in shared accommodation, you know, a lot of the responsibility of the mosque would be taking place elsewhere. They might be instructed within the homes they're working in. They might worship in uh, someone's back room. Uh, but once there's families, the needs start changing. Um, and so that's when we start talking about maybe some of the more complex mosques and more interesting mosques we see emerging. Um, so I'd argue there is this relationship, and I'd like to look into it a bit more. But uh, for now, that's just the context of it, which leads us to today. Um, and so what is the kind of general picture of mosques in Britain? Well, the exact number is unclear. Uh, there's a pretty reliable-ish um, estimate from an individual called Mahmoud Naqshabandi. He tracks this all. He's a data kind of IT technician, uh, analyst, um, and he maintains a website called Muslims in Britain, and he kind of keeps these, this database of mosques quite kind of uh, religiously, if I can use that term. Um, and he estimates uh, nearly 2,000 mosques in the UK. Um, a more kind of conservative estimate comes from Sophie of Gilead Ray and Yahya Bert when they uh, considered there might be somewhere between 850 and 1500 and this estimate is from 2010 so uh, about eight years uh, ago this estimate was made so we are looking at numbers growing um, but essentially it gets difficult because there's lots of kind of anomalies you might look at house mosques some of them might be registered some of them might not be uh, you'd be looking also at temporary rented properties do they count as a mosque is, for example, something like, uh, until very recently, Carmarthen in West Wales was renting a place for educating children on the weekends and also for the Friday Jum'ah uh, uh, congregational prayer. Does this count as a mosque or not? Um, these kind of uh, uh, temporary rented properties as well create an ambiguity, as well as institutional spaces. So some of you might have got upstairs, there's a prayer room there, people worship there. You know, this might be, uh, does this count as a mosque? Does this count as part of that final number? And there's much more ambiguity as well when you look at somewhere like Aberystwyth. Now, Aberystwyth has a prayer room that essentially is a big building and functions as a mosque, not just for the uh, student community, but for the much wider community in Aberystwyth. There's a, it becomes a center of the locality's religious life. So there, are, there is some ambiguity. But we're looking at about nearly 2,000 mosques. So there's something important here. British Muslims have invested the time, the capital, the resources, limited as it is, into establishing these 2,000 institutions across the country. It's, it's really quite important. And understanding why and what they do, I think, is a really important part of understanding religion in the 21st century. So there's a challenge here as well, which is diversity. So um, I promised Mark I wouldn't move from this spot, but I'm going to step back a teeny bit, because <laughs> I'd like you to be able to see this very well. So this is a selection of six different mosques from Cardiff. Um, and I'm going to do something interesting, which I'm going to use the pointer. And I'm going to also ask you guys to kind of tell me if you recognize it. So this one here? Almana. Oh, Almana, okay, students at the front, so again, we have a student mosque. This one here? Medina mosque. Medina, okay, the really keen students at the front. <laughs> the rest of them now. This is Medina mosque. So Almana, house mosque, very close to the student population just across the tr uh, train tracks, uh, not far from here. Um, uh, this is Al uh, Medina mosque. So it was a large property, a warehouse. It was uh, burned down in an arson attack sometime in 20, 2009 or thereabouts. Uh, and they, have, they now have this kind of like a modular building here shipped in from um, uh, abroad, and that's now their mosque. Um, this one here, not you guys? <laughs> Shah Jalal, yeah. So this is the former Calvinist Methodist Chapel on Cruz Road, very visible, um, uh, very architecturally <coughs> impressive, I think. Um, and it's also uh, predominantly a Bangladeshi mosque. Um, this one here. 
Osman, Masjid Osman, yeah. So, uh, let me get the back of that. Uh, that's a house mosque, it was formerly run by largely Bangladeshis. Um, then taken over by uh, Deobandi Imam and runs and continues in the same location. This one here? Al Street to start was Islamic Centre, one of the most important mosques in Britain, in Wales, uh, in Cardiff for lots of reasons, including the fact that it has this historic lineage uh, behind it. And this one here? Yeah, the two's on the front. So Dar al again, one of the really innovative uh, mosques, uh, student mosques, and very uh, kind of um, sort of active. Now, just a little selection. You have purpose-built mosques like South Wales Islamic Centre. You have house mosques like Al Minar and uh, uh, Masjid Al Man. You have modular buildings which are adapted for use. This is formerly, it's a church hall, but it's a community hall essentially in architecture. And it wasn't really used for Sunday worship or anything. It was a community adaptation. And you have former chapels. Um, so this, this whole diversity in architectural use. But we're also looking at this kind of diversity of function as well. So this is a quote from uh, McLaughlin, Sean McLaughlin. And he essentially talks about how some mosques in the diaspora could be seen as reinventing and Islamic tradition by slowly taking on a range of community functions that were more or less unheard of in Pakistan today. So while being primary places of prayer and devotion since the 1980s at least, some mosques in Britain have also functioned as advice centers for the unemployed, members of parliament surgeries, homework clubs, youth centers, elderly and daycare centers, and spaces to prepare food for communal gatherings such as weddings. So he's talking really here about the expansive and diversive role uh, mosques are taking in Britain today. Um, and he's writing in 2005, so again, this has been about 13 years since then, um, and that's only continued as that generation I spoke about has been increasingly coming of age and taking responsibility for mosques. So there's this question of diversity um, and how we explain it. And essentially, I try and conceptualize it, uh, in my thesis at least, through a model I call the interspatial mosque. So I'm going to talk about it a bit and try and walk you guys through it and talk about why I utilize this model and a word might tell us about the diversity and also um, the function of British mosques. So what I'm kind of doing, and I'll start down here, uh, which is first to say that it's a social model in terms of it adapting and adopting the emic language of the congregants I encountered during my research. It's using the words and terms they used to talk about the function of the mosque. It is not a theological ruling or edict. So I'm going to point and look directly at Sheikh Haroon and Sheikh Mansour. I am not trying to be a mufti, um, so you know, no problems on me, please. This is purely sociological description of the congregants and how they spoke about the mosque and its functions. Um, and so this is definitely in operation in the ethnographic case study I used. I'm going to argue that it has validity and applicability beyond that as well. And it can help us understand mosques throughout Britain. And so there's this three-tiered level, the Farq, the Farq fire, and the Sunnah. And it's a sunnah which is the interspatial because it adapts and moves. And I will talk about this and explain it in a bit more depth. But essentially, it's one which looks at need primarily. And it goes back to that early motivation for establishing mosques. There were families, and these single men suddenly were no longer single, and they had kids, and they needed a place for religious nurture, they needed a place for communal gathering, they needed a place to express a religious identity that was more than singular. Um, and that's where the mosque stepped in. And that's why time and effort and money was invested into mosques. And so that's my kind of um, argument that at uh, each level and at each point, it's the need which is a driving factor in conceptualizing what activities take place and then also understanding that diversity. So the first level, the fard. Um And fard in Islamic theological language means the theologically obligatory. So the five daily prayers are fard for the individual. Uh, going to hajj if you have the money is fard. All the five daily prayers of fasting, of paying zakat are fard. You might also talk about other things being fard. Kindness to your elders and to your parents. Or, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm struggling not to think of examples of fard. But there's a whole range of theologically uh, uh, sanctioned actions which are obligatory. Um, but when it comes to a mosque, how do you understand this? Well, many people said for the mosque, the really fundamental thing, the core thing that had to take place to make the mosque a mosque, and there is this kind of boundary of what actually makes a mosque. That is a question that I tried to explore in the thesis. But for many, it was like, well, it's absolutely essential that the fard takes place, which is the five daily prayers and the Friday prayer, uh, five daily prayers and the Friday prayer. Now, again, uh, point out here, theologically, there's a debate about whether or not the Friday prayer is obligatory. Uh, if there isn't the community present or the space present, and this whole uh, debate there, which I'm not going to go into. 
but certainly in the conceptualization of the individuals who are running the single mosque, uh, in my case study, the five daily prayers were an obligatory part of the mosque's fundamental identity, as was the Friday prayer. Um, and so I asked one of them, you know, was there ever a time the mosque didn't do the five daily prayers? Uh, well, only when we closed for work. It wouldn't be a mosque otherwise, would it? So that was a congregant responding to me, uh, someone who's quite senior in the leadership. That was a self-conceptualization from the ethnography, and I think that's applicable elsewhere as well. But when we want to apply this to the level of a mosque, uh, a mosque beyond this case study, we might understand it as being places and mosques where there is that key fundamental, fundamental activity of the form taking place. So a key obvious example might be prayer rooms, prayer rooms which are located in institutions. They are very often used and established for these five daily prayers to take place. Especially in universities, they're there for the Friday Juma when individuals can't leave the campus or don't have the time to leave the campus to make the five daily prayers, uh, the Friday prayer. Uh, that mosque provides that space. Uh, we can move beyond that as well because I think when we're looking at the far, very few mosques engage at that level or provide that service alone. Because like I said, the key priority of mosques which were established in the mosque building era was the uh, provision of services to children and families. So we're looking at a communal level. So you can think of the term the Fard Kifaya. So Fard Kifaya means commun uh, commun uh, communally obligatory. So we can talk about here things like the Friday, uh, the Janaza. So the Janaza is the funeral prayer. And the general articulation of it in kind of classic thick books are uh, that if uh, no one does it, everyone is held responsible for the failure to take, uh, to undertake the funeral rites for a dead person. But if some people do the funeral rites for the person who's passed away, then everyone is relieved of that responsibility. So it's a bit of a weird theological or thicky jurisprudential concept, but essentially if some do it, everyone else is relieved of the obligation, but everyone does have a responsibility to it if it doesn't take place. When we look at mosques, this is where the space becomes a place to fulfill some of these activities which might be listed and considered uh, for the kifaya. So certainly the funeral prayers, um, but as well the education of children. Generally in Islamic fiqh books, they'll say that the education of the child is a responsibility for the parent. That's where it becomes fard. But the community has to be able to provide some place where that can take place. Uh, some space in which edu uh, the education is actually offered. So mosques become places where those communal activities are first met and fulfilled. The education of children, reading the Quran, praying, worship, the very basics of uh, Islamic literacy. But also then we're talking about marriages and apikas. Akika is a celebration after a child is born, there's a certain sacrifice. And so we're talking about those communal activities, those rites of passage which take place. Um, and there are dozens of mosques, dozens, hundreds of mosques which fulfill this example. I think the house mosque, which we might kind of all be familiar with if uh, you know, you're uh, in this uh, kind of field, is a very prototypical example, I think, of the uh, uh, fortifier level of operation. It's fulfilling the Friday prayers and the most basic necessary needs of the local and immediate Muslim community. So um, in one uh, case, uh, 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 one incident from my ethnography, there was an incident where there's essentially an imam's meeting where all the imams come together uh, in South Wales. And one mosque, one particularly active mosque, is gloating about all the different activities it does, or oh, we do this and we do this and we do this, and we have the kids club and hobo club and so on. And naturally, someone else then gets a bit defensive and is like, well, you know, that all we can do is the Friday prayers and the, uh, you know, the madrasa. But that's really what's needed in our arena. That's really what's needed where we are. And even the madrasa is oversubscribed. So there's this idea of what's really fundamental in our geographic space are these two services. And that's what we're looking for. That's the congregation we're serving. So uh, that's where I started having the idea of maybe this is an operation beyond the immediate mosques. But then you're looking at the sunnah. And I use the term sunnah here for what can also be called the interspatial level. And one of the key reasons I say sunnah for this level is one, uh, it's because people will always link this back to the prophetic mosque. So, you know, people, if you, you can go, I, I've yet to come across an example where this hasn't been done, but I'm sure there might be. But generally, when you go across the country and you speak to individuals who are uh, in operating operate mosques, and they might be doing innovative stuff, like a GCSE tuition club, or they might be doing a workshop for, uh, you know, uh, young people to go to uh, education or employment, or they might be doing a mother and toddlers group, they'll always somehow link it back to the prophetic mosque. Or the mosque in the prophet's time did this. Um, 
And I really doubt the Prophet's mosque did do GCSE tuition. Uh, <laughs> the idea is that there's this impetus, this, uh, this idea of the mosque at the Prophet's time being more than just a place of worship or prayer. Um, prayer rather than worship. Uh, and it had other things to going on. And so the sunnah, uh, the, the, the wider activities, so if you think of the forehead here being the five daily prayers, and this level here being uh, you know, the weddings and the apikas and the education, then the spatial level is here, the sunnah level. And this is everything else that a mosque could possibly do. And they will always locate it back into the example of the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet's mosque, and they will always put it within that frame of religious understanding as well. So again, you know, some people might, in trying to describe activities taking place at a mosque beyond the prayer, talk about secular activities. But again, that model isn't quite right because it's not secular, because it's understood with a very strong uh, religious paradigm. Secular is a very European post-enlightenment idea of things that aren't religion. That doesn't quite work when religion imbues everything from GCSE tuition right the way through to the boxer size clubs on a Saturday evening. Mm -hmm. So it, it's this level. And it's always as well adaptive. So uh, mosques will pick up halakas if they determine there to be a need. Oh, there's more new Muslims and converts coming in. Let's set up a halakha for them. Suddenly they discovered that there's, uh, you know, uh, for example, we were talking earlier about the al Manar Mosque in London and the Grenfell Muslim Response Unit. This was an organization of mosques and Muslim charities which banded together to set provision. You know, when there was the cold weather, again, this was mentioned in the last uh, um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, the last uh, lecture we had on mosques. But, um, you know, they were opening up this space to homeless individuals so that they could uh, get some... Um, uh, warm places to sleep. So again, it's responding to the need as it's emerging. And it will always be located at that level of example of the prophet exa prophetic example. So key example here is Dar al Isra. Dar al Isra is a really good example of an interspatial mosque. You know, it's doing campaigns with citizens. It's uh, so a community organizing uh, establishment. It's holding interfaith events. It's uh, inviting political figures. You know, this is a very good example of an interspatial mosque. And just as uh, you know, that model might predict, of you know, uh, when there was cold weather, <coughs> it was one of those mosques in Cardiff which opened up space for homeless people to have accommodation uh, when the temperatures were plummeting and the need, if there was a need. So always responding and looking and uh, operating at a level of um, uh, considering what is the local dynamic, what is the local need. And so we have this diversity. Farid mosques, which are prayer rooms or less than that. Uh, Farid Kifaya mosques, if you can call them those, which provide those house mosque basic necessities, operating in a local community, serving a mainly local congregation, and larger mosques, interspatial mosques, doing a huge range of activities with resources and space and uh, uh, human resources available as well. Um, and what we really challenge is we call all of those mosques. We say mosques or maybe masjids in most cases. And what we're lacking is a language to describe and speak about the diversity in a meaningful way. So within at least Christianity, you can kind of say the words like chapel, church, and cathedral. And although it is, it's, a, it's a boundary and it's not hard and fast, everyone kind of gets a sense. Chapel is smaller than church. Church is something a bit more common and uh, commonplace and standard, whereas cathedral is something a bit more uh, significant or larger. You, know, you generally get a sense of there being this diversity of operation. Um, and the chapel tends to be local. There's local chapels. Um, whereas the cathedral tends to serve a wider municipality or a city or a whole area. Um, and so there's this kind of a spectrum that you can talk about when it comes to Christianity. But we're really lacking the same language to speak about the diversity of mosques when it comes to Anglophone Islam. Um, so I'm just going to take a bit of an opportunity for you guys to fill in for me some terms that you might have seen in operation and where you might put them on here. And I'll very happily... Uh, Point the laser where you think it should go. So, any other terms besides mosque or masjid for describing that diversity from small mosque to big mosque? Musalla. Musalla? Okay, so where do you put Musalla? Farad. So, Musalla around here. So, Musalla is literally prayer space, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Someone else said something? I'm sure someone else said something when I. Said the same. You said the same thing. Okay, what other terms are out there? So, Jamia. Jamia? And where would that go? It's interspatial. Yeah, so the Jamia would be at this level. Anyone else? Would a quiet room count? Quiet room? So, yeah, where would you put that? Um, that one's difficult. It's first, but it could be interspatial as yeah, well. Yeah, you're right, because it'd be adaptively used within an institutional space, yeah. Anyone else come across any other terms? Any other language at all? A bit quiet. I've got a list coming of like quite a few words, so I'm hoping you guys can preempt some of them. 
Uh, so there are words out there. Jainamas. <coughs> Jainamas. Okay, I, that's not on my list. Okay, Jainamas. So what is a Jainamas? Fill me in. It's a prayer Prayer mat. So everywhere where they operate. Anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Can yeah. So it's bug. mobile. A mobile <laughs> space of a, of a mosque. And again, this is the diversity and difference maybe in sort of the difference between Islamic prayer spaces and uh, uh, Christian prayer spaces is that there really doesn't need to be a space established by any way consecrated other than simply just pointing in the right direction and purifying that space often for a prayer mat. So you have the madrasa too, which is always having a mosque for example. The madrasa, yeah. yeah. So the madrasa again, where would you put the haram, <coughs> which is bigger than the cathedral. The haram. Yeah. Okay, so haram would that exist? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So haram is an area, a whole area, and in particular we use it for um, uh, the the sacred mosques of um, Medina and Mecca and Al-Aqsa, uh, Jerusalem. So I'm going to just jump to the next slide um, so you guys can see. So this is roughly just me throwing some ideas down of how or terms we might use to describe the diversity of mosques. So at the kind of third level is house mosque, maybe, prayer room, musalla, and I know um, Sheikh Harun, there you are. So the mosque you're operating and then you, op uh, uh, you, have as, uh, you, you work as the imam at, uh, is called prayer room. Right? So where would you put that on this uh, spectrum? I'd like to put it. Where would I like to put it? Where would you like to put it? Where would you like to put it first? <laughs> Maybe one of the cathedral books. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Not ambitious. laughs> so uh, prayer room on the planning application for cathedral and intention. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, when we're looking at some spaces though, like especially you know, if we're thinking of um, say um, uh, Muslim institutions that aren't primarily mosques in their function, they often have a prayer room, but they might still be called a masjid. And so that prayer room takes on really basic function of being the place of prayer. Um, and somewhere in the middle, you have these things, zawiya. So Khalid used to have a zawiya, no longer, um, but that's almost like a, a outhouse of the mosque. Uh, you know, it's a place of education, sometimes um, a spiritual or Sufi lodge. Uh, masjid is, again, key term. Taka, which I think is, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that right, that's a, a Turkish term for a bit of a, an abbey or a, a, a ribat is another term that I'd be using in North Africa. And markers, markers is an important one I think. So mark, you will find markers used as a term for mosques in Britain. So uh, markers is something. Um, and it means centre. But I think it, it's maybe, you know, again, in that sense of just how people are using terms. Makras implies something a bit more than just the, the five daily prayers. Makras implies they're doing something at this end of the spectrum of activity. Uh, whether that's borne out by all the examples, I'm not sure, but I'm kind of uh, suspect, suspect it is. The same as center as well. Um, so especially when they put words in front of that, so when it's cultural center or welfare center, you start seeing those mosques are conceptualizing themselves already as being more than religious in the kind of Western European sense of the term. They're saying culture or welfare or uh, something else in their names because they want to imply that what we're doing is not just our private pious worship. We're also thinking of ourselves socially. We're thinking of ourselves politically. We're thinking of ourselves in these other realms of existence of human activity. And finally, these terms here, Jamia Masjid, Jamakana, Eid Ghada. So, um, for example, Cardiff's Eid Ghada, I'd say, is pretty much City Hall at this point. You know, when possible, it's really <coughs> booked out by um, uh, the Muslim of Wales and you have this big congregation, a few different mosques will get there, and you have three or four thousand people in the two halls. Um, and that's what the kind of Eid al Jamia Masjid would be back in uh, a maybe predominantly Muslim country. You'd have the local mosques, but you'd also have the Jamia Masjid, where the Jummah takes place and the big congregational prayers take place. Um, and I think that model is starting to emerge in cities as well. You have the big mosque where the big stuff happens, for uh, the ones with the organizational and physical space, and that's often maybe sometimes outside the city. But within the city, there's a different type of operation, and very often there's just lots of these, lots of the kind of uh, the chapel mosques, if you want to call them that. So there's a question of diversity here. I don't quite have a hard and fast answer. I think uh, we're as a community, as a British Muslim community, quite a long way away from having that kind of uh, language emerge. But I definitely think that it's needed because we do need to be able to speak of the diversity of function and diversity of capacity of mosques. Um, because again, you get this as well, you know, everyone's talking about walking, I mean, journalists quite often might be interested in visiting mosques, but there's a difference between visiting a house mosque and visiting <coughs> a mosque at the further end of the spectrum. And, you know, Kathy Newman famously made that mistake. She went into a small house mosque, 
got confused, walked out and made a big deal out of it uh, and said she was escorted out. There's a whole story there. But essentially that was the mistake she made. She presumed that any mosque would be operating at that kind of capacity. So I'm going to speed up a teeny bit because we've got about 10 minutes left and I do want questions. But um, I'm going to speak now about where this model might point in the future. Uh, let me, uh, yeah. So um, I spoke about the inspirational mosque responding to the local needs. So uh, it might respond to, you know, there's a fire, being able to organize capacity and uh, welfare services for them, or it might be this cold weather and providing uh, care and accommodation for those who are homeless. It might be there's an emerging different demographic of Muslim community, you know, uh, suddenly there's an influx of, say, uh, refugees from a certain part of the world, there'll be services set up for that particular community, and in special mosque will be adaptive and reactive to those local needs. But we're also seeing, I'd argue, um, in the spatial national mosques, <coughs> mosques responding to national <coughs> needs or perspectives or uh, uh, niches, you might say. So, if there was a capital city mosque of the UK, if there was like a you know really symbolically important mosque um, which takes on the function of the most kind of um, you know the center of the of the of the nation's community, um, the closest thing we have to Canterbury, I would maybe argue it'd be East London Mosque. Um, I know that's arguable. Um, there's a lot as well. I wouldn't ever argue this in London because you know the guys from down the road would start arguing against me about you know this other mosque I've ignored. But I think East London Mosque, for lots of different reasons, politically as well as um, in terms of uh, the media discourse, takes on the function of Britain's capital city mosque. It's it's the big one. It's the important one. It's the symbolic one. It has the history. It has the um, uh, uh, architecture to be able to maintain it. It looks like a mosque kind of look. And it's in an area as well, which is predominantly very Muslim. And so it just has this very uh, 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 significant niche as a capital city mosque, as the symbolic kind of center of activism and, and uh, vibrancy. Um, I think it is arguable that there are a few other contenders, uh, most of them London-based for obvious reasons. Uh, Regent's Park Mosque, I think, might also be a contender for that. But we're starting to see maybe a marketplace of uh, contestation with mosques trying to maybe take that capital city, British, you know, Heartland Mosque title. But there's other niches out there. Um, so anyone recognize this mosque? Shout out the answer, just to get rid of vibrancy. Anyone? Yeah, exactly, the Oxford Studies, uh, Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. Uh, it's, it's the Chapel Mosque. They modeled it, modeled it like an Oxford College. Mm -hmm. So every Oxford College has that kind of like square thing, I can't remember what it's called, the quad, and then it has a chapel. So they set up a similar model as well. Um, and you know it's been funded by donors from across uh, the world. It has this really kind of, you know, it really feels like a landmark in Oxford. It feels like an important stake in that city of you know academic activity. And I think OSIS, the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, is also making a statement here about uh, internationalism and uh, academic <coughs> research and kind of really tying in in that way as well about what uh, a mosque should be and do. And so here again, that interspatial responding. Uh, the spatial model, I think, here is responding to a national picture, and maybe even an international picture. Uh, this one? Come on, Riaz. Go on. Dewsbury. Dewsbury. Um, so, w tell me about this one, Riaz, because uh, this is, I think... Absolutely. So, Riaz has conducted his PhD on uh, the Piki Jama, so... Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, he's the expert on that. I think uh, nationally, you could not find someone who knows more. Um, and this is the, uh, is it official or unofficial headquarters? How does it work? It's the official headquarters. Official headquarters, right. So this is the official headquarters, as well as being located with the Madrasa um, and a Dar al Ulum essentially. So this has, again, another symbolic function, another interspatial function beyond just doing the facilities and activities. It's playing a role nationally. Um, as being the centre of this massive movement, one of the largest Islamic movements in the world, this is the British centre for it. Um, and this is one of the most two important madrasas in the UK, so um, I should give a shout out to Burry as well, because I think that's uh, the contender, uh, but it has a very different identity. But again, this is I think an emerging <coughs> picture. And finally, this one, anyone? Cambridge. Cambridge, absolutely. So this is uh, Tim Winters, uh, Abdul Haqim Murad's kind of project he's been spearheading here. Um, and I think it's not an, uh, it's not a coincidence that Oxford and Cambridge kind of have 
uh, have been included in, in this. I, mean, I think they have important roles nationally to play. So Oxford, its, it's centre has been funded all by you know, international donors. You know, Yemen gave some stone and Saudi gave this and the king of so-and-so gave that. And it's really just like a big building, really well-funded international. Um, and it has some kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's architecturally tied in a certain way. Cambridge Mosque has been much more funded from the ground. It's really been pushing Kickstarter and crowdfunding campaigns and lots of little ways of everyone chipping in. And the model it's going for is to become Britain's first eco-mosque. Eco-friendly and designed with, you know, uh, carbon neutral uh, principles in mind and also aesthetically as well tying into this idea. So again, I think this is fulfilling another special purpose. And this is actually built so far. It's, it's not uh, complete, but it's getting there. So um, uh, this is an emerging mosque and I think when you take these in, into account you start to see um, something which is I think interesting um, and I think in maybe 10 years time, 15 years time you'll be able to very confidently and clearly articulate well you know this is the so and so mosque and you know I could have also put something like Gunko Sharif which someone mentioned earlier uh, which I think is a very important Sufi slash Bangladeshi uh, spiritual uh, mosque in, in quote unquote um, uh, kind of it's, it's, a, it's a space of um, uh, Ziara, it's one of the first places uh, Sufi shrines in, in Britain so again, we've seen this uh, varied landmarks, uh, varied landscape of sacred spaces, British Muslim sacred spaces emerging. Um, and I think the model can help us not only describe the diversity, but maybe look towards where things might be going. Uh, so this what next is not so much about the masters, but about myself. Um, I'm hoping in the next few years to be able to publish a book. I'll be based on my ethnography. So um, I'll really be trying to give, again, that in-depth understanding and pick up on some of those things I was talking about, sacred space, sacred time, and the everyday mundane things that take place in the mosque. Uh, that's what I hope to be doing. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and for listening, and I hope we do have some time for questions, and I look forward to taking them. Thank you very much.